morning again. Praise God for everyone being here. Please join me again in prayer. Gracious Father, Lord, we're just thankful uh, in this difficult time, Lord, that we can still call upon you, that uh, there's nothing, Lord, that has taken you by surprise. You are completely aware of all things. You are the God of all flesh, and there is nothing too hard for you. So, Lord, we ask your blessing this morning, Wes, that you keep us safe, keep our families safe. And those, Lord, that are battling uh, this disease, Lord, we lift them up and ask a special blessing on them this morning. We pray, Lord, that especially those that are, are um, on ventilators and may not make it off of them, Lord, we pray that they will accept this beautiful gift of your salvation in Christ Jesus. This is what we pray in his holy and most precious name. Amen. You know, uh, I could have used a lot of different scriptures, but uh, this one here really spoke to what I want to speak to you about today. The title of this sermon today, of course, is Character Lives Matter. Character Lives Matter. You know, I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, the only thing that Christ will not change when he gets here will be our characters. Characters will have to have been changed before he gets here. And there's absolutely no reason for our characters not to be shaped and fashioned like after, unto him, except that maybe we don't want that. But, of course, God's will is that we should be like him. We should be like him. And when you think about that, the Bible says, be ye holy, for God is what? You know, a lot of things started firing in my mind as I was preparing this last night. Um, you know, um, things like, you hear the cliche, like father, like like father, like son. Uh, Jesus said to the, the religious people of his day, you do the things of your father, the devil. You know, Jesus was just like his father. The Bible made it clear. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the? Amen. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, we will see him as he is because we will be like him. And uh, that's what this is all about today. You know, um, I was thinking about this, and I had gotten, uh, for the first time, actually, uh, different types of feedback from the last time that I spoke. Some good, not, some not so much, and I, I'm okay with that. Um, some individuals think that uh, we shouldn't be dealing with social issues. We shouldn't have to speak about those things from the pulpit. We should only concentrate on what they believe to be things that uh, I, I really couldn't even say, but... Um, I like to stick with the Bible and what the Bible says. That's a good thing to do, isn't it? Stick with the Word of God and, and we'll be safe, right? The Scriptures are our safeguard. So <clears throat> with that, I, wanted, I asked you last time to uh, go home and read a particular chapter. Do you remember what it was? Anybody? Jeremiah chapter 22. That's right. I heard someone say it. I want to look at that just for a minute because... Uh, what I say really doesn't matter a whole bunch. What the Bible says matters a lot. So let's just look at Jeremiah 22 for a moment. And let's just try to apply this to whatever um, situation that individuals find themselves in when they're in a, a situation where there is a, a power structure. Um, I think this would be applicable, whether it be in a marriage or whether it be in a government or whether it be um, even in a family. So Jeremiah chapter 22. And we're going to just concentrate on a few verses. How do we know when it is that we're right with God? Okay? How do we know when we're right with God? Scripture says here, Thus saith the Lord, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and speak there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah that sitteth upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, 
neither shed innocent blood in this place. I think it's pretty clear here what God feels about a particular group of people, the oppressed, the fatherless, and shedding innocent blood. In fact, he goes on and he promises that, we'll go down to verse uh, 6 and 7. For thus saith the Lord unto the kings of the house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon. Yet surely I will make thee a wilderness, and cities which are not inhabited. And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. So God is basically saying what? You know, if we do not do the things that he has recommended here or has commanded in verse 3, something is going to happen. So I would just say take this and apply this even to um, our country or anything where, like I said, there's a power structure. God expects certain things from those that are in power. And this is not to say, you know, this particular minister, current administration or any administration, all administrations, God expects righteousness in everything that happens. If you look at Psalms 89, the Bible tells us that his very throne is established on what? Any of you know that? His throne, is, let's look at it. That way we'll be safe. Psalms 89 And the reason I'm going to this is because, um, of course, the Bible tells us that God is the God of justice. He's a just God. And everything that he does is right and is just. His very throne is founded upon justice and judgment. <clears throat> Let's see. 14, right? Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. You know, that reminds me of a scripture in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. It says something about Enoch. What did Enoch do, according to the scripture? Enoch walked with the Lord. What does it mean to walk with the Lord? Is it, is it, is it uh, you know, uh, I'm about to, to date myself. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean what the, um, the uh, group Aerosmith and Run DMC said, walk this way. I knew you would know that, Craig. You know, it's not talking about that at all, is it? It's talking about how you conduct yourself, how you live your life, right? Enoch lived so close to God that God simply took him. He translated him, you know, and... Um, you know, my Bible says God is not a respecter of persons. Amen? You know, can, could you imagine someone saying, you know, Lord, um, I, I, I need to speak to you about something. You know, Lord, you took Enoch, but you left me here. You know, I, I have a bone to pick with you, Lord. Why did you take Enoch and leave me here? I could see God kind of just chuckling a little bit and say, do you really want me to answer that? James, James do you really want me to go into that with you? You know? Enoch walked so close with God that God, you know, I heard a preacher say one time, God and Enoch were, were taking a walk and they got to just chatting and conversing with one another. And God simply said to Enoch, you know, uh, we're closer to my house now than we are to yours. Well, why don't you just come and go home with me? Amen? Amen? I want to share something with you about uh, Enoch and how he conducted himself and what it means to walk with the Lord like Enoch did. Because God is not a respecter of persons. He is a God of fairness. And what he does, for one, he will do for those who are in harmony with him as well. It says here, you know, and, and I'll tell you something. I was in such a rush to get out of here, get here this morning, that if you notice, I don't have um, my uh, eye protection, my, eye, my glasses on. So bear with me if I stumble a little bit. I'm trying to enlarge this enough so that I can see it. Let's see if we go this way. I might be better. A couple of things. Full and free, the invitation comes to us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
What an invitation. It was this invitation that Christ gave to Enoch before the world was destroyed by a flood. That time was no more favorable to the development of Christian character than is the present time. Yet, sin, yet, and in his power, withstanding the corruption of that degenerated race, degenerated age, Enoch perfected a Christian character. The voice saying to us, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, saith the same words to Enoch, assuring him that it is followed, if he followed the Savior, he would not walk in the darkness of ignorance. The word instructed, the Lord instructed Enoch and made him the watchman. He was a faithful witness to God, warning the inhabitants of the old world not to follow the example of Cain worshipers, but to serve the living God. You know, what an invitation. If we follow God, it's about character, isn't it? Character, especially now, matters. Character lives matter. That's what it's all about. That's what the gospel is all about, isn't it? The gospel is about changing us from what we once were to what he is in character. Is that right? You know, the gospel is, you know, the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the righteousness of Christ revealed, right? We're told that justification is our title to heaven. Have you heard that before? And sanctification is our fitness for heaven, right? I mean, God will take each and every one of us, or anyone, he says, anyone that comes unto me, I in no wise will cast out. You know, he says, a, 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 a bruised reed, I will not break, and the smoking flax I will not quench. Is that right? Anyone that comes to God, God will take us with all the baggage that we have. When we come to him, he says, come unto me, come unto me. But God does not keep us the way we come to him, does he? He begins that work of transforming us, of changing us from the inside out and making us and fitting us like unto himself. That's where the sanctification comes in. Sanctification is our fitness for heaven. We need to be fitted in order to live in such a place. Is that right? Because the Bible tells me that in that place dwelleth righteousness. Righteousness dwells in that place. So if you're going to dwell there, what is it that we need to be made? Righteous. Makes sense, right? And all of our righteousnesses are what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Now, one of us in and of himself can appear before God in our own clothing, so to speak, and be qualified for that place. We must have that perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. We must be transformed like unto his image. You know, so today, I want you to think about some things. Because basically everyone kind of lives with the image that they have of God. You know, everyone has their own image of God, but the Bible has an image of God too, right? So we just read something in Jeremiah 22 about who God sides with. We have the same thing in Matthew chapter 25. It's extremely important, so let's look at that. What does the Bible say about this Christ that we serve? And who does he side with? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25. I think you guys know where I'm going. You know, God has what the Bible says, a controversy with the nations. Not only will God judge us in accordance as individuals in accordance to all that we have done, but God judged the nations as well. Matthew chapter 25. Let me see if I can find where I'm looking for. Down in verse 31. Who said that? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall sit the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them, on the right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you 
from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall they say also unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they, answer, they also answer him and say, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them. Who's speaking here? The Lord, right? It's, this, is, this is his words, his own words, right? Not our opinions. Is this an accurate picture of who does God side with? He says, Then shall he answer, saying, Verily I say unto thee, you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. The last time I spoke here, it was really, and some people got it, they really did. It was a plead, a plea to people of God not to take Christianity as a spectator sport, not to think that we can just sit back on the sidelines and watch things happen and do nothing about it. Christ says no, no. Wherein you have done it to the least of these, one way or the other, you have done it to me. If we simply preach, 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 and do absolutely nothing, we don't get our hands dirty, so to speak. We don't get down in the, in the mud, in the trenches, and let God use our hands, let God use our feet, let God use our mouths. Do we really think that we will be able to simply say when he comes, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. There's another thing that will be said as well. To the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us and crush us. Hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne for the wrath of the Lamb. For his day has come, and who should be able to stand? Christianity is far more than just preaching. Delivering the three angels' messages is far more than just going out and telling people which day the Sabbath is. What really happens to you when you die? You should be eating this, and you shouldn't be eating that. You should be wearing this, and you shouldn't be wearing that. God expects us to do more. Are these my words, or are these the words of the Savior? I was sick. God expects us to go to the aid of the oppressed, to those who have been trodden down, to those who are being trodden down, and this is what the gist of my sermon was last time. It was simply a plea not to find yourself in the category of, of being, having a form of godliness, but what? Denying the power thereof. You see, it is the work of the Holy Spirit that makes the life of Christ real to us. He is not a co-savior. He is the facilitator. He is the one that comes and lives with you and ends you in you and reproduces the very active present life of Christ. It is the Holy Ghost. That's why it's imperative that every single morning and throughout the course of the day, we ask, we start the day by, Lord, please fill me with your spirit. Baptize me afresh. The baptism you got when you were first brought into this church is not going to be sufficient for a day-to-day -day experience with Christ. We have not, the Bible says, because we ask not. Are we asking on a daily basis, or is it true of what he said about Laodicean? We're increased with goods and need of nothing, Lord. We got this. We know how to handle this Christian thing. We've been doing it for a while. We've been preaching, Lord. We've been giving seminars. We've been doing this for some time, Lord. We really don't need you. Just sit over here. We got this. If you do not ask God for the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, you are running on your own power. You're running on your own power. 
you are simply implementing your own works program. My Bible says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. None of his. We desperately need the spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead, to move in us in every single thing that we do. We cannot say, Jesus, you know, sit there until I need you. Can't do it. As I said before, Christianity is more than just a, a, a bunch of doctrines that we believe. It's an experience. Righteousness is by faith. It's just not something we believe in. It's something that we experience. And we experience on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment, hopefully, basis. So to think that all we should be doing right now is simply, you know what, having more... Let me ask you a question. If every single person... What do we got on the planet now? 7.7 billion people or, or, or thereabouts? If everybody joined the Seventh-day Adventist church right now, would that make us any more prepared to meet the living God? No. No. So it is not about numbers. It is not about simply adding to our, 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 our church roles. It's character lives that matter. We are going to see him as he is. And if we are not as he is when we see him, we will be slain by the brightness of his coming. Our God is as a consuming fire. Anywhere sin is found in the presence of a holy God, sin will be consumed. It will be consumed. So we are far better off now letting the Holy Spirit live and be inside of us and consume every single thing that causes offense. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. Let us not keep him knocking on the door. Jesus wants to come in to each and every one of our hearts. And he wants to bring his celestial uh, uh, spotlight into the, the darkest crevices of our minds. My Bible says the heart above all things is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. Some of us think that we're pretty good Christians. We've been doing this for a while. We know how to do this. We are so sure of our relationship with God. Mind you, God handpicked the people that he said were stiff-necked. He handpicked the people himself, a people that he gave his oracles to. They had everything. And then the scripture says he came into his own, and what happened? His own received him not. Why didn't they receive him? Why didn't they receive him? Because they were looking for a different type of Jesus, weren't they? They were looking for a different type of Messiah. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible tells us they also about another Jesus. And that's why I said we need to make sure that we are following the Jesus put forth in the scriptures and not the Jesus of our own making. Because if we are following the Jesus put forth in the scriptures, what they did, we will do and are doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul, would to God ye would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with it. Are we sure? Are we sure? that we are following the Jesus. When I hear people saying to me, you know what, we just need to, we, you know what, you shouldn't be talking about those things. You shouldn't be talking about these social issues. I said, well, you know, my Jesus said that, that, that the nature of his love's, love causes him to identify with the oppressed, with those who have been beaten down. My Bible says that God is a God of justice, and how can we 
not be a people of justice? How come it is that, that, that you know, I, I look at this and, and I got, the, got the, the, um, the letters and the emails, and I looked at them, and one of them anyway, I took, uh, this individual was very serious. I believe so with all my heart. And I looked at this and I said, you know, Lord, what should we, what would you be doing right now? Whose side would you be on? And I looked at some of the things that were in these, these, these discourses, and I noticed that they were talking about, you know, this Black Lives Movement is a bunch of anarchists, terrorists, and all this. And I said, Lord, you know, he told us something very, very important in Mark chapter 8 and then the same thing in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus had worked a miracle. He took a man who was blind and he made spit. You remember this? And he put it on his eyes, right? And then he says, what do you see? What do you see? He said, man, Lord, I see men walking like trees. Jesus said, come back here. Come, come back here. And he touched it and said, all right, again. And then, then, then he said, now what do you see? He said, I see things clearly now. Do you know of anybody in Revelations chapter 3, maybe, that had an eye problem that had something to do with not seeing things quite the way they were? Maybe the Laodicean church? Did they have a problem? Were they naked? Were they blind? To the point where they said, we're in need of nothing. We've got it all, Lord. Maybe we haven't seen the things quite the way we think. Maybe we've been presenting the Jesus of our own imagination. So when you see these things that are happening, we simply say, it doesn't concern me. I just have to preach the three angels' messages, the everlasting gospel. If we can't see the connection between the everlasting gospel and standing for justice, Isaiah 45 says he is a just God. So we are to be what? Like him. Is that what the scripture says? We shall see him like he is because we will be what? Like him. Will we feel the same way about things that he feels? Or will we have our own agenda? Lord, that's not what you called us to do. You didn't call us to stand up for justice. What? What? How can a just God not expect his people? He says, my very throne is established on what? Justice and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. God is big on justice. Just go into your little programs to put in the word justice and see how many things pop up. And we think we can just go ahead. You know what? I heard someone say one time, you know, I cannot hear what you are saying to me because what you are doing to me is screaming too loud in my ears. Or you could say, I cannot hear what you are saying because what you are not doing is screaming too loud in my ears. How is it that we can truly expect people to hear and to listen to this message that we have for them if they say, you don't care about me? All you care about is increasing your numbers. You don't really care about me. When people really understand and feel and sense how much you care, they, you care about them, will they be more apt to listen to what you have to say? Does that make sense? If I know that you don't give a dog about me, I don't need to hear nothing from you. Nothing. But my Bible says we have the everlasting gospel to preach to everybody. Everybody. But if we do not accompany that everlasting gospel with true actions of getting involved, you know, we're missing something here. We're missing a wonderful opportunity to be the head and not the tail. We could be out there showing people what good, legitimate protest looks like, and not being like some that just seem to want to focus in on the fringe group that are doing things that we all know that are not right. There's always been a fringe element. Anytime there's been a movement of any significance, children of Israel coming out of Egypt, was there a fringe group that attached themselves to them? They were called what? The mixed multitude. Were they the ones that were saying, hey, look here, uh, 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 listen, Aaron, we don't know where this Moses has gone to. We don't know. He's delaying his coming. Sound like anybody? He's been gone a long time. Does that sound like anybody? Make us other gods. Make us other gods. Take us back into Egypt. Were there a group of people that attached themselves to that movement and said that? How about 1844? Was there a lunatic fringe or a group that, that said, hey, you know what? Miller might have something here. 
Craig, you might be right. Jesus might be coming. I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. And October 23rd, they were saying, well, I knew he wasn't coming. I was just playing along with him. I knew he wasn't coming. There has always been, even Jesus' inner circle had an individual that attached himself to the group, didn't he? Jesus didn't pick Judas. He attached himself. And this same thing that you see going on right now, you know what? You got people all over the world that are saying, this is wrong. What was it about this? You know what, when I was, um, when I was in high school, um, the quarterback for my football team became a pilot later in life for United. And I was sitting in a place and I was watching TV one time, and lo and behold, there he was on TV. They had this motorcycle rally, rally in a place called Sturgis. Anybody ever heard of that? This, that big old motorcycle thing they used to have every year? They, Bikers of all different walks of life, they descend on this city called Sturgis. And lo and behold, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, and, and there he was, my old high school quarterback. So I said to the guys with me, hey, I know him. And what did they tell me? No, you don't. <laughs> you don't know him. You're just making that up. That's a lie. So I politely went and got, you know, every year into this very day. This guy sends me a postcard of him and his family, and a letter. He starts out in the letter, it says his side, and it t he tells me all the things that have been happening in his life throughout the course of the year. Then he goes down and says her side, and he tells me you know, the things that were happening you know, in, in the, his wife's life. Every year. Now, I never send postcards or all that, or even responded to it. You know, I just don't do it. You know? But, but to the, he's, he's, he's faithful with this. So I went and I got the picture of him, and I came back to the guys and I said, look. And they looked at it and they said, hey, that's, that is him. That's him. That's him. The point I'm trying to make is this. People are often going to tell you that what you're doing is not right. It's not true. You shouldn't be doing this. Mm -mm. No, you shouldn't be getting involved in these social issues. You should not be calling for justice. I'm like, are you serious? What are we supposed to be doing? Just sit by and watch things that we know we know are wrong and think that God is not going to hold us accountable? He has a controversy with the nations, and they have an account, and once that cup is full, God will deal with them. And it is not different for us. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked, and you gave me some clothes. I was thirsty. My, I was parched. And you gave me a cool drink of water. Lord, what are you talking about? When, 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 what are you talking about? When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Jesus came here to comfort those who were discomforted. He came also to discomfort the comfortable. And quite frankly, some of us have been very comfortable just sitting back thinking that we're doing our Father's will. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're having revelation seminars, Craig. We are letting people know about the 2,300 days. We are letting folks know about the health message. We are, you know, but getting into the places where we really make a difference, getting down into the, into the, into the trenches, and really being the hands and feet of Jesus, we'll let somebody else do that. We'll let somebody, we'll just, we'll just continue to concentrate on, you know, preparing people for the second coming. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For in it is the righteousness of God revealed. It is the power of God unto salvation. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You want to know sometimes, where is the power in the church? Do you all sometimes feel like, you know, Lord, where is the power? We need power to accompany our preaching. If the preaching is not accompanied with the power of the Holy Ghost, guess what it will do? Fall on deaf ears. If we are not under the unction of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to happen. Some water, some, I can't even think of it now. You know what I'm trying to say. 
but the Lord provides the increase. It is all by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what, honestly? Some of us are relying more on our political affiliations than on the Holy Ghost. But my Bible says it is not by power, nor is it by might, but it is by the Spirit, thus saith the Lord of hosts. It is the Spirit. It is the Spirit that will meet you when you get up in the morning if you say, Lord, fill me this morning and give me my marching orders. Fill me with your Spirit, Lord. It is not safe for me to go out there, Lord, without your Spirit. It's not safe for me. I need you to fill me with your Spirit. And show me, you know, I had some, somebody ask me, well, what should I be doing? I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't even respond. But this is my thought. You have a God in heaven. Cursed is the man that trusteth in who? And makes not the Lord his strength. Why would you ask me when you have an omnipotent God that tells you if you acknowledge him, he will direct your path. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Don't ask me. I'm a sinful man that, 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 you know what, get things wrong a lot. That book of James, I like that book for some reason. <laughs> but it says, Craig, you know, it says we all offend in many ways. Some versions say we all stumble in many ways. I may stumble more than most. Do not ask me what you should be doing. I am, my name is James, not Jesus. It is the Holy Ghost that will give you your marching orders. It is the Holy Ghost that will direct you in what you should and what you shouldn't be doing. Don't go to a man. Oh, would you tell me what I'm supposed to be doing? No, no. We got a man that's sitting in the seat right now seeming to be as if he is God. That's a dangerous place for him to be, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to even try to get close to that seat. It's already occupied. Do you not believe if you ask your God, will he, or maybe that's what we're afraid of. We ask God what we should be doing, and he'll tell us. And we'll have to get out of our comfort zone. That's what God wants to do. He wants to shape you. The comfort can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. If we're sitting back and we're comfortable, we don't need to get involved in those social issues. You know, I'm so glad Martin Luther King didn't feel that way. I'm so glad that the abolitionists didn't feel that way. I'm so glad that God has always had people that are willing to stand up and be counted, because if he didn't, my life would be very different right now in America. It would be very different. People, listen to me. We need to have that transformation, or all we are is a bunch of noise. People says, you can show me better than you can tell me. Let me see what you do. Let me see with your actions. And when we step out and take the lead on some of these things and show these people, oh, hey, you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Yes, I am. And you're out here? Well, you're, wow. Oh, by the way, I have something that I, I'd like to share with you if you give me a minute. The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. We're going to be here for a while. You know, uh, in, in Patriarchs and Prophets, you know what it tells us? Christ did not come to this little planet of ours merely for sinful men to view his law as it ought to be viewed. He came to vindicate the character, character lives matter, of his father. He came to show what God is really like. And now he has called us to do the same. Not to just sit back and say, let somebody else handle those things. Let somebody else march for justice. You got people that are out there willing to risk their lives, calling for change. And then some of us, not all, but some of us, only want to point to the fringe that attach themselves and try to hijack. Satan has always done that. That's an old move. It's an old move. But I noticed that some people, listen, some people actually spend more time listening to their cable news source than they do with the word of God. They spend more time listening to what these talking heads say, whatever cable news you listen to, I don't care, right or left, 
They spend more time becoming the reflection of other men's thoughts. Well, what do you believe? Well, whatever he just said. <laughs> I believe that. It is not safe. And it is an affront to the omnipotent God. He says, come unto me. Talk to me as, as, you know, as, as, a, as a friend talks to a friend. Every moment of the day, that's what Enoch did. That's what got him translated. He walked with God. He talked with God. He was completely saturated with God, all things God, because he realized character lives matter. And if we think it doesn't, remember what he said to those that did it not. Remember, I didn't say this. Don't take no, no rocks up underneath from underneath your tunic and stone me. I didn't write the book, but I believe it. And he has told us, if we think we can just sit back and do absolutely nothing, and that's what this sermon was about the last time. It was a plead not to be caught up with we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power of the omnipotent God, the Holy Ghost, in our lives. We don't even ask for him. We get up and we do a drive-by prayer and we hit the door and can't figure out why the devil just whoops us all the way back home. How we messed up so miserably that day because we didn't even bother to ask, Lord. Lord Jesus, will you walk with me today? Can I walk with you today? Will you go with me, Lord? Will you just take me by the hand? Lord, because it is not within me to order my steps. I can't do it. I don't have the power, nor do I have the wisdom. I can't do it. But I know you can. And my Bible says that, beloved, we don't have to worry about the second coming of Christ. When he gets here, we shall... Be, see him as he is, because character, lives matter. And we will be like him. And that's the bottom line. I don't care how many Bible studies you get. Those are good. I don't care how many prayer services or meetings. I don't care how many sermons you preach. That's all good. But if you are not like Jesus, if I am not like Jesus, when he cracks the sky, it's all for naught. It's all for naught. So you know what? If you want to send your letters or you want to send tweets, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. But, you know, I kind of feel like Jeremiah. The Lord said, don't be afraid of their faces. Because, you know, the way I feel like this, if I'm preaching truth, present truth, you should sometimes be uncomfortable. Because comfort sometimes can be a dangerous place to be. Very dangerous. Gracious Father, Lord, we are so thankful. For Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord, that Jesus identified himself with some of the very people that we see today that are being oppressed, that are being beaten down, that are even being killed, Lord. And you are calling us to be your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Lord, you don't want us to be that people that draw near to you with our mouths, but our hearts are far from thee. If we want to be right with you, Lord, you've explained to us there. And you have told us, have I not showed thee, O oh man, what is required of thee? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Help us to that end, Lord Jesus. We pray in your holy and most precious name. Let us not get sidetracked by the leaven of the Pharisees. You told us to be careful. Many of us have allowed the culture wars and stuff to infiltrate our beliefs and our thoughts and whatnot. We need to be very careful. In your holy and most precious name we do pray. And all of your people said, amen and amen.